Chief of police today ordered hundreds of his men on leave to return to duty because of tensions generated by last night's racial violence. Randy Daniels reports on what happened. Last night's unrest was touched off by the fatal shooting of 18-year-old Obi Wynn, a black, by a white tavern owner who accused the youth of trying to steal his car. An angry crowd of several hundred residents responded with a rock-throwing, window-smashing, burning spree through the predominantly black business district of northwest Detroit, despite efforts by Mayor Coleman Young and police officials to restore calm. Detroit, already in the grips of a devastating economic recession, was ripe for violence. Unemployment approaches 25 percent, more than 125,000 workers. And the jobless rate among black teens is reportedly twice that of adults. The bar and Andrew Chenarian, the bar owner, now accused of second-degree murder, are both controversial. According to area residents, Chenarian allegedly maintained a white-only policy at the bar. This is a white, honky bar. Peckerwood bar. Why do you say that? Because the man, he got a buzzer on there. If you can come down and you see that you're black, you do not get in. Sammy Moore operates a small antique and hardware shop in the area. He fell victim to looters who caused more than $2,000 in damage. I was the only one along here that had a nice one that's, you know, without being bricked up. And I liked it that way because I took pride in the way the things were kept. But how are you going to have pride in something like this? There was nothing in the cash register, so they dumped it out on the floor and they wrecked it completely. The city's rumor control center has received anxious calls inquiring about the extent of hostilities, asking if there is more to come. Mayor Young today condemned the violence. While some people with legitimate concern, showed anger, frustration at the demonstration in front of that bar. Other hoodlums and rip-off artists were taking advantage of the situation and ripping off the area between Seven Mile and St. Martin's, for instance, uh, on Livernoy and other areas. That will not be tolerated. Community leaders are now on the streets in northwest Detroit trying to prevent another night of unrest. Randy Daniels, CBS News, Detroit. This afternoon, the bar owner accused of murdering the 18-year-old was released on bond. Large-scale school busing for integration may not resume at all, not because of resistance from a school board, but because of a ruling from a court. Probably no one was more surprised by the Detroit busing decision than the pickets who gathered in front of the federal building last Saturday. They came prepared to protest what they thought would be a pro-busing decision by federal judge Robert Damasio. Instead, the judge ruled that the way to solve Detroit's school desegregation problem was to use techniques other than forced busing to compel the state and the city school board to look into alternatives for upgrading the quality of education in the city. But Detroit's NAACP is far from pleased with the lack of emphasis on busing and says it is going to the Federal Court of Appeals for a reversal of the decision. The U.S. Supreme Court mandated the Federal District Court to develop a school desegregation plan. Judge Damasio has totally ignored that mandate. Instead, he has set himself up as an expert on school curriculum and left the job of desegregation in the hands of those found guilty of segregation. The question now is, what do you do with 150 brand new school buses purchased in anticipation that Judge Damasio would rule in favor of busing? As of now, the Board of Education says the vehicles will be used for general student transportation and to relieve classroom overcrowding. Hal Fisher, CBS uh, News. There are fears and there's anger. And I'm wondering how much of it you think the problems that you have in the school splash into the school from your own neighborhoods, black and white, from your own homes, black and white, or whether this is just something that is generated within the school. Can you follow? No, I, I think you're quite right there. Um, the school is just a symptom of what the whole social setup is um, in regards to this area. For a long, it has been white for quite a long time but things are changing now. And here I'd like to clarify what I said before. When I said the whites are, are scared, I meant scared in terms of change. People always resent change, and they're afraid of the new. And uh, that's what I feel, that this is a product of what's happening in the homes. The kids can only repeat what they've been taught at home, what they've heard at home. What do you think about that? about the general question of, of it coming from 
homes, neighborhoods, and all the rest, as well as where there are 3,500 kids in contact. Well, it's most definitely coming from the community, as well as from the school and outside. Because as many parents as was student here, when, it, when the disturbance was here and was parents involved in the disturbance. So it is the whole social community. I'm wondering, you know, I see a lot of kids walking around this, this school with long hair, which one thinks is supposed to mean peace and love and groovy and hip and like togetherness and brotherhood. I see a lot of people, you know, having the facade and the images, you know, there are a lot of afros which says something about identification and that kind of thing. At the same time, I hear some white students go on black students niggers. I see some black students coming on really, you know, with a great chip on their shoulders, being very arrogant, pushing, you know, that kind of thing, when it may not be necessary. Can you really deal with those kinds of problems, despite the facade of coolness that we all like to have? That's that's the kind of problems the whole world has. It's not just us, you know. And, well, we, all we can try to do is deal with them, you know. I mean, even the world can't solve their own problems. And, like, we, we can try by starting with ourselves, and that's what I think a lot of people aren't doing, you know. Like, maybe it's dependent on a group, you know. Well, our group says this and our group says that. And I think we should take a stand individually and look at our own consciences before we say anything. And then maybe we can branch out from there and spread to other people. But, you know, I don't, I don't see the world and, the, you know, our country can't solve the problems that we're having here, you know, I don't expect us to. We, all we can do is try. Um, I think when it comes to changing people, all right, some people are never going to get along and like some white kids may never like black kids and some black kids may never like, you know, the white kids. I think that it's all a matter of, you know, equality or letting everybody have the same thing and not, you know, putting people into certain categories and doing some things for others while you don't do the same thing for the next group of people. Now you know that there are some white people, some of the, the parents of some of the, uh, of some of the students here at the school have perhaps not had it feel that in their employment situation maybe a black fellow or a minority guy has got a better shot right now at an advancement. You, you've heard those things, maybe you haven't heard those things, but there are white people who feel that. You know, the, the guy at the, the machine next to me has got a better shot because he's been deprived of opportunity now, he's getting a better chance than I am. Do, do you think that all of that is once again coming into the fears and all that jab that, that you've been talking about? Yes, because they're afraid that we're going to come and we're going to take their positions. We're going to take all the openings and take all the things that they want. We're just going to overtake them, take their whole lifestyle away from them. And also, excuse me, also many white people feel that if there are standards to be set, then in order for black people to achieve something, that you have to lower those standards, which is not true. Well, I was, I don't really think that, you know, it's fear of us taking anything, but, you know, like for college and applications and stuff, I'm applying for colleges, you know, and stuff this year. And I would like to, I was wondering, you know, why on all the applications they ask you your race right away, you know, and I, I just can't see anything in that. I think they should judge a person by, you know, what he's like, what, what his requirements are, you know. And maybe that's one of the problems. They're not just they're hiring minorities, but they're hiring, like, you know, people that aren't really qualified. And, like, if you take the case in Washington of uh, the person that had something like a 3.6 average and he was, uh, they wouldn't let, accept him in a law school, and another guy had a 2.8 average and they took him, you know, and he took the case to court and I don't know the result of it yet, but it's, I think it's still pending in the court. And it, it's stuff like this, it all creates, it all adds to the unrest, you know, and the uneasiness between the people. Is there anything any of you want to say that we haven't said? Yeah, I'd like to say. Um, in referring to what you're saying about the school being a product of what's happening at home, what I'd like to see rather than that is the reverse, because not many people in the outside work have the opportunity that we have here. They go to work, they're really more or less in a very small group, but here we're mixed with 3,400 other students, and we have the opportunity to get to know the, the other kids. We have opportunities to go into activities with them, and really getting to know them. And so I'd like to see us get along better here, and maybe show our parents some. If one goes forward, film of each of you while you're not talking. Uh, so I'll sit here and while he's doing this, Mr. Mayor, I'll tell you uh, basically what we're what we're interested in doing here in Detroit, and that is not focusing on the problem of Cody necessarily, but that that whole 
neighborhood kind of thing, and I want to uh, assure you in, in uh, the most sincere terms. Uh, well, as I indicated, uh, honestly, to uh, try to accomplish here, uh, I think that a lot of the people that I spoke to out there, of course, are, are very upset with the media. But we always run into that, and they feel that that, that Detroit's gotten a bad shake. But of course, Mr. Agnew felt that he was uh, getting a bad shake from the media. Mr. Mayor, in the last couple of weeks, uh, there have been some incidents at Cody High School. I'm not interested in, in focusing on those incidents, but only uh, as they manifest the kinds of problems that I'm sure that you're concerned with in Detroit. Uh, there are, there, we've talked to a number of people in that neighborhood. Many of them have said they're moving out of the area because they're afraid that as, uh, as integration proceeds, their property value is going to go down. It's an old story that I know we've all heard. But nonetheless, that is the reality of the situation. And there's a very tense situation, not only in the school, but it would seem in the surrounding community. I'd like to know from you, sir, how, how important, what significance you attach to, to the general atmosphere in that, in that district and how it relates to Detroit. Well, of course, uh, we attach a very great significance to it. It has a very basic relationship to Detroit. Uh, we have gone through periods like this in other areas. The schools are certainly a primary uh, center for conflict especially with the issue of busing having been forced upon us by uh, some of our political leaders who see it as an open sesame to political office. But I, I would like to say that the incidents of violence between school children or students in this city are way down. The exodus uh, from whites to the suburbs is not only going down, but it's in the process of being reversed. And the number of incidents of violence between adults based on racial issues is down. The Detroit Police Department has established a special unit to deal with the harassment uh, because of racial differences uh, throughout the city. And we will enforce that uh, anti-harassment uh, ordinance uh, to the fullest. Like it or not, Mr. Mayor, and we've discussed this already, uh, Detroit does seem to have a bad reputation in certain areas, a murder capital of the world and all the rest of that. And as you well know, uh, at night in this city, it is very infrequent to see a lot of street traffic, uh, a lot of white street traffic, at least that's been my experience, 10 o'clock, 11 o'clock. When did you come in here? Well, I was in town. Well, well, what what day did you come in here? Uh, I came in here last two nights ago. Okay. If you had been downtown mm -hmm. Saturday night, this okay. past Saturday night, we would have seen it literally right. crawling with people, okay. black and white. You the, just picked the wrong day. Okay. Stick the, around till this weekend. Okay. <laughs> the point that I'm trying to make, uh, sir, is, is whether you are concerned about keeping a viable white activity in the city. Tell concerned. me about that. Confidence in this city. This city is not going down. It's coming together and moving forward. And I believe that the media has a responsibility for looking at the objective facts. Detroit's not asking for a break. Detroit's asking for the truth. I hope that this interview is the beginning of that truth. Just to follow through, once again, I talked to some of the people out there. They, they seem to be afraid that their neighborhood all of a sudden is going to turn black. Maybe, maybe that's the issue. Maybe that's the problem, sir. It's, it's just a, perhaps an unfounded fear, but nonetheless well, a fear. Of course. Uh, now, now, tell me about that, your That's accompanied that. by some unrealistic fears that to the degree any blacks move into a community, the value goes down. I think that's been proved to be untrue. Uh, the people moving Detroit out. Detroit neighborhood. Okay, we're rolling around. Mrs. Wright, uh, the lady in the white pants. What uh, does the problem splash in from the community you know? I mean, now there are a lot of kids coming to this school, 3,500 kids. That's a, as big as some towns in the United States. And there, you know, there's got to be diversity. Now, do you see it splashing in, or, or what do you see happening? Uh, yes, I do see it splashing in, but uh, as in most things, it's a, ve it's a few. It's not 3,500 racist kids that we're talking about. It's a few, as in most cases, you know. But that few feeds in and causes some of the problems, and it's definitely coming from the home. Because what I teach my child, this is what my child projects when it's out. And definitely it is coming from home. Well... I, I don't know. <laughs> We're just about talked out today. We. I understand. Maybe that's why it's a good time to get. You know, get <laughs> we we'll have get down to the uh, discussed matters since eight o'clock this morning, and I don't think that. I don't know. I just can't think of anything else. What troubles say. you most about all of this? I think the violence when you have the gangs and the violence in 
in, not gangs, I don't mean gangs, I mean groups of people, but I guess anybody over five people is <laughs> closer to a gang. That's what... No, this building, it's empty now, I, I believe. And it could stay there empty for the next 10 years and nothing would happen. So what is brought into that building is what is exploding now, you know, and, and that's very real. And as the ladies have said before, you know, we, we teach things and they are brought in, inside of, of the structure. And of course, hopefully, with the committee that's formed now, we can begin to deal with inside the structure and come out into the community and be, begin to get things going, uh, uh, relating and people admitting if we can just deal with the truth, what is really very real, I think that we can overcome some of the problems. But people do not wish to deal with reality and truth. Do you, do you accept, uh, do you think it is a fact that there are black kids here as well as white kids who are responsible for this problem, or do you take a position that it's just the other no. way? Tell no. Me, tell me your position on that. I think that there are both black and white kids that uh, are responsible for of the problems that go on here. And I think that there are many outsiders. In fact, I know that there are quite a few outsiders. But the fact still remains that it was brought in, you know. It wasn't there, it was brought in. And when one person, you know, is frustrated, then the other becomes uh, frustrated and began to clash. I'd, I'd like to ask uh, Mrs. Campbell a question, if I might, down on the far left, and that is simply, now you've lived in this neighborhood. I overheard you say that you're not going to move if, it, no. if it's integrated. But there is concern, isn't there? Yes, there is. Tell me about those concerns. Oh, everything from real estate uh, values to crime, uh, educational system. Uh, I think it runs a general, a group of problems, plus uh, people believe that uh, a city is dying. This is another reason they move out. When you look at downtown Detroit, now when I first came to Detroit and looked out the window of the Pontchartrain Hotel at 9 o'clock and the streets were empty, I thought maybe everybody knew something that I shouldn't know, that I should desert town uh, too. Now, are Detroit you Detroit is beautiful. I, I, uh, I'm not knocking, you understand what I'm saying. The fact yes. is at 9 o'clock in Detroit, the streets are empty. Now, do you, are you afraid, not you, but are people afraid that, geez, if this whole, you know, if there's too much integration, our neighborhoods are not going to be what they always have been? And I'm not, you know, leveling that charge at you or anything, but is that uh, a concern? See, this is very hard for me, as I said before, to uh, relate to this because it is not my personal problem. Uh, I only wish that uh, we could get the people to go downtown because Detroit is be a beautiful city. Do any of you have any thoughts on any of that? Uh, Mrs. Wright, Mrs. Wright. Well, lots of people from the, you know, talking in general with people, they do feel like this. But uh, again, that's something deep within the person. That's that. That's that show you where you know some of this comes from. Because if they feel like this, then you know uh, their families. Do you talk together and you discuss things together? And if you say you're afraid to stay in a city because uh, in a neighborhood because it's becoming uh, predominantly black or because a lot of blacks are moving in, then that feeling has got to go into the children. This is Rosanica. What do your neighbors tell you about those fears? Now we all have fears. Damn, I have fears, you know, and and, uh, and concerns. Now, what do your neighbors tell you, ma'am? It's the same thing as Mona said. The real estate, which seems very important, crime rate. But I live in an integrated neighborhood. And there are no problems. There, to me, there are no problems. Of course, I. Happening all over the street. I can't, well, I'm pretty much so, but, and there's no problems in my neighborhood. If you, what is it that you, when you go home, if you, let's say you go have a drink with your neighbor or whatever, let's say you uh, go have some coffee with your neighbor when you get home, what is it you're, you're going to want your neighbor to know, Mrs. Campbell? What is the most urgent message you can give your neighbor as it relates to this neighborhood, potential integration of this neighborhood? 
the obvious problems of this school. What is it you want to let her know? All right, I'm very educationally oriented, and I feel in any school, if a student applies himself, if a parent is interested in his student and gives him support, you can get a great education as my family has. Are you saying there are some people who are looking for an easy way out and they're knocking the school and just don't want to apply themselves and work right, hard? Right, exactly. Uh, if you are oriented to apply yourself in education, you can get a great education in the city of Detroit. Got it. I think you're amazing ladies. I really, um, honestly... Anything. We're not recording what we're... Don't smile or anything. Just listen to this. Here. Okay, your name, first name is what? Uh, Jerry. Jerry Bowser. Right. And does your community association have a name? The Everett, Community, uh, Aaron, uh, Everett Parent Teachers Community Council. Okay. Uh, Mr. Bowser, there's been an awful lot of uh, an awful lot of talk about what's happening in your neighborhood. Uh, there have been quotes in the newspapers from some people who've resented the fact that some black people may be moving into the neighborhood, are moving into the neighborhood. There's been the matter of the Richards family, the church. Uh, I know that you have some strong feelings about it. What are they? Well, I, I feel that the uh, the community at whole is not as bad as the news media has in total have made it look. Uh, uh, as I told you, talked to you before, uh, most of the people who live in this community are uh, in the income where they just can't afford to move. And uh, I think most of them feel that as long as we're here, we have to live with our neighbors, whether they be black or white or what color. And we don't want a lot of problems. We, uh, we never had a lot of problems. Uh, the Richards case... Uh, I'm not real familiar with uh, the church. Uh, I, would, I didn't know anything about the church until I saw it in the newspapers, as a matter of fact, and on television. This community as, ho as a whole has got a lot of bad publicity in the last 10 days, 12 days, in regards to Cody High School and uh, the community as a whole, and I, I don't think they deserve it. They're mostly good people, uh, hardworking, and uh, they don't deserve what they've been getting, and we're not them kind of people. I'd like you to give me as, as honest an appraisal as you possibly can, and I'm not trying to put you on the spot, and I don't think, I'm not trying to make you look bad, but, but how do the people here feel about the possible integration of this neighborhood? Now, Detroit has become pretty much of an all-black city. It's very difficult in some parts of Detroit to move around the street. Now, right. now what do these people here feel? There must be a lot of gut reactions when you work hard. and uh, I think there's tensions are high right now. I think uh, in time, if the news media, for one, would lay off some of the problems that they're been uh, uh, exploding, I would say. I guess exploding would be a good word. If they just let things cool down a little bit, number one, let the kids run this, not run the school, but take care of their own problems. Maybe a lot of the parents ought to stay out of it right now until the kids get back together and uh, get their heads together and uh, they'll work it out. 
One last question. How do you feel the tensions are high? What does that mean? I don't know what that means. Well, I think uh, the tensions are high because it was blown out of proportion by the news media, uh, newspapers and television. Uh, a lot of things that were supposedly had happened to Cody did not happen. A lot of things that have supposedly happened in this community have not happened. You feel that this community can accept integration in when it comes? Oh, yeah, absolutely. No, no, no reason why they shouldn't. Uh, as I said, number one, financially, there's a lot of people in this community who just cannot move. They might want to, but they just can't do it. And uh, a, a black lady in a meeting Thursday said uh, a very, uh, uh, she made a statement that was impressive to me. She said, I don't want you to love me, but I want you to respect me. And that's how I feel. I don't want black people to love me necessarily, but I expect them to respect me. I respect, I want all people to respect me. I don't care whether they're black or white, and I respect them. And if people respect one another, they'll they'll get along. Are there a lot of houses going up for sale? Not on this street, no. No. I've been here seven years, seven and a half years, and we've had uh, two houses sold on the street. You're a good man. Thanks a lot. That's a good job. Let's get a couple of silent commercials. Really upset with him, and I... Uh, Why? Well, I think him and Jack Kelly, and Tom, John Kelly, I guess, uh, both uh, blew it out of proportion. And uh, like I told you before, we're not all George Wallace's. We're not all that way. We're mostly good people. And we just want to live and, uh, like I said, I'm sorry. Uh, let these kids work it out. They'll, they'll do it. The kids will do a lot more than the parents will ever do. Because the parents are, they're uptight about a lot of things. That Would you just repeat to me that, that, that line which I've that they've used several times and tell me what you mean by it? Well, I mean that we're not all. Well, tell me what it is. We're saying. not all like George Wallace. We're not that type of people. Uh, the community has been uh, made up to be that way. I think. Uh, I think a lot of people think that we're conservative, uh, ultra conservative, and we're not. Uh, it's been said that a lot of the policemen and the uh, firemen live in this neighborhood, which they do, because they do have to live in the city of Detroit. But we've had firemen and, and policemen living in this community for a long time, and they're not all. George Wallace's. And we're not all George Wallace's. We're all just people that want to live. And we don't need all this hassle. Okay, first of all, what are your names? What's your name? Uh, Robert Fisher and Renee. Okay, F-I-S-C-H-E-R? No C. No C. F-I-S-H-E-R. Mr. Fisher, uh, there's been a lot of talk about uh, your neighborhood. There's been, there have been some problems in the school. You live here. You've lived here for 15 years. What do you, uh, what do you and your neighbors feel about, uh, about what's happening at the school and, and uh, the integration of this neighborhood? Well, first of all, I feel that uh, the racial problems are are blowing up. I think, uh, like I said, their teenagers will always have some problems in school, and when they happen to be black and white, uh, it's blowing out of proportion. And uh, as far as the neighbors, uh, we know most of them quite well. And I don't think they have any animosity towards uh, colored movement in the neighborhood. I think they would judge them on what type of people they are rather than their color. What would happen, uh, let's, let us say then, uh, let's do it one more way before I talk to your wife. What would happen if uh, three or four of these houses were suddenly occupied by black people? I think most of the people in the neighborhood would stay. I, I think that only the pressure from real estate companies would uh, force people out of their homes in this neighborhood. Mrs. Fisher, what do you think about it? Uh, I'm, I'm essentially interested in what you think, first of all, about if this neighborhood were suddenly... Uh, integrated if, a, you know, several black families moved I, into the street. I feel that it's integrated now. There's a lot of black families in this area. I don't think 
Um, maybe two or three people on the block might sell their house, but not uh, the majority of the people. It wouldn't make any difference at all. I will sell my house one day because I will one day want to get away from the school and have a little more property, maybe an acre of ground or something, but it surely won't be for black and white problems. It doesn't matter if my neighbors are black, you know. It's the type of people that they are, and I think everybody around here feels pretty much the same way. I don't believe this black and white problem is neighborhood related. It just doesn't seem like it could be. You know, I know too many people, and I've um, heard too many of their viewpoints on it to know that the majority of people don't feel that way around here. Thank you. That's very good. That's all we need. That was simple enough. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. And good luck to you. Okay, would you mind telling me your name, first of all? Uh, Jack Muir. M-U-I-R. M-U-I-R. Mr. Muir, I'm interested in your perspectives of uh, on what's been going on in your neighborhood. We've, we've seen an awful lot in the media about it and uh, had the problem at Cody, a uh, black family moving in, having some problems for, for several months now. And I wonder uh, what, you, what you really think about it. You must have some kind of gut reactions as well as uh, intellectual responses. Well, I'm kind of sorry to see the friction happening. It's, it's almost an inevitable process. At least it's been that way around Detroit recently. Whenever neighborhoods change, there seems to be a point when the first black families move in, they're accepted. And then as a significant number, or they become more visible, a lot of the right, white people start to say, well, we're going to fight it. We're going to do something about it. And uh, you get the children upset and you have the disruptions at school. But it's happened in every high school along here as the... Uh, percentage of black students has increased. There's been a point where the school switches from a predominantly white to a pre predominantly black school, and that's when the friction develops. When the school's all black or all white, there seems to be no real trouble. It's during this transition period, and that's unfortunate because, uh, let's face it, we're going to have to live together somehow or other. What do you think are the honest feelings on the part of your neighbors, Mr. Muir, about integration? I think most of the people are afraid of the classical uh, decline of property values. For instance, the house next door, they've been trying to sell it for a year and a half. They've been unsuccessful. We moved into the house neighborhood about five years ago, and at that time, we were cautioned, well, don't move into there because it's going to be a changing neighborhood, and you're not going to have, you know, you're going to suffer a loss when you try to sell. Although we're not ready to sell, there is a... Family welfare costs went up again last year, this time just over 21%. That report today from the Department of Health, Education, and Welfare, which blamed part of the increase on the growing ranks of jobless fathers. The department said a record $24.8 billion was paid out on aid to families with dependent children and for such things as Medicaid and relief programs run by state and local governments. The government normally announces the yearly price tag for welfare, but with welfare now such a hot political topic, this year's figures were furnished only in response to query. Unemployment has also been one of the contributing factors in the continuing troubles of the city of Detroit. Those troubles have gone largely unnoticed outside the Detroit area, but they're shaping up now as a full-blown New York-style financial crisis. We have a report from Randy Daniels. Detroit's fiscal crisis surfaced during the height of the 1975 economic recession, but the city has been on the road to financial instability for years. The tax base has steadily declined, and so has the population, noticeably the white and black middle class. The automobile industry, Detroit's economic lifeblood, is only now beginning to recover from its worst sales slump since the Depression. Today, the unemployment rate is over 17%. More than 100,000 Detroit workers are without jobs. All of that, plus a spiraling inflation rate, has forced the city deeper into debt. Now Detroit's short and long-term debts total more than $100 million. The city's credit rating has dropped and borrowing has become more difficult. The city's workforce has been cut by 20% to 18,000 over the past two years. Another 1,000 police officers will be laid off in July. Mayor Coleman Young has lobbied for federal and state aid. When Michigan Republican Governor William Milliken offered a $35 million state aid package, Young, a Democrat, rejected it. He said there were too many strings. In short, the governor's package requires us to make all the cutbacks and layoffs now scheduled, plus more, to renounce forever the hope of restoring even the most critical services, and even then Detroit has no assurance of receiving the state aid package. Our only alternative will be to cut deeper. We're past fat and muscle and even bone. We've shed enough blood. 
Detroit is trying to revitalize its downtown area with a $337 million redevelopment project. The 33-acre Renaissance Center, as it is called, is the brainchild of industrialist Henry Ford II. It is privately financed by 51 corporations, and planners say it will provide 5,000 new jobs. As big a project as the redevelopment center is, economists and community leaders say it is not enough to save the city. What is needed, they say, is a commitment from the federal government in the form of more money. If, in fact, the working people in this city are ignored by not allowing federal funds to come in here, by not uh, producing full employment for uh, black people in the city of Detroit and across the country, then you're exactly right. You're going to have a predominantly black, uh, low economic, low income producing uh, type of individual. And that could spell disaster for this city. Detroit's fiscal crisis has been overshadowed by the sheer size of New York's economic troubles and the controversy that preceded federal assistance there. Despite the efforts of industry here, officials say the city cannot continue to provide vital services without help. Massive federal and state aid, they say, is the only cure for Detroit's economic ills. Randy Daniels, CBS News, Detroit. One of the highest crime rates in the country. Now, a weekend attack by hundreds of youths has prompted authorities to focus on a particular segment of the city's criminal population. Don Webster reports. Detroit has had black gangs for years, but until recently, they spent most of their time fighting each other. Now they have banded together and are staging mass attacks. They stopped a rock concert at downtown Cobo Hall last weekend. There were beatings and robberies, one woman raped, 47 youths arrested. Alarmed city officials recalled earlier than scheduled 450 policemen who had been laid off for economy reasons. They will be concentrated in the downtown areas. The city has imposed a 10 p.m. curfew for all youths 17 and under unless accompanied by an adult. That's awkward for popular nighttime events. Last night, the Detroit Tigers had their largest nighttime attendance in six years. This quiet-looking street is the dividing line between the city's two largest gangs, the Black Killers and the Errol Flynn's. Youths blame the gang violence on unemployment. And they get misled by, you know, older adults, you know. Like, you know, these people to be around, you know, ain't got no job walking around committing a lot of crime. That's where they're getting it from. Officials say at present a juvenile is arrested at 10 in the morning, is released at 3 in the afternoon, and comes back a hero to the other gang members. We're convinced that one of the things you have to do is take away that hero incentive. Pick that kid up and for six years he ought not show up. Six months he ought not show up, depending on the crime. In downtown, the flight to the suburbs has been going on for decades. Detroit is now about 60% black. Many citizens feel the usual complaints, such as unemployment, are no excuse for robberies, riot, and rape. One merchant has had his share of problems. On Saturday, his restaurant was robbed. On Sunday, his shoe store was ransacked, and he says $30,000 of goods were taken. It's the first time we've ever really had any uh, major violence like this. I think it's mostly the youth gangs and the kids, and unfortunately, it's something they're going to have to get under control, but we're staying. If idleness has caused crime here, the situation may get even worse. Because of an economic crisis, the present plan is for Detroit schools to eliminate all varsity athletics starting this fall. Don Webster, CBS News, Detroit. Renee Richards, the female tennis player. Detroit, which has come to symbolize the problems of America's cities, today opened its new Renaissance Center, a hotel office building complex it hopes will not only symbolize, but lead to a rebirth of the city. Don Webster reports. Detroit has more than its share of urban problems. 8,000 abandoned or empty homes, severe unemployment, a high crime rate. 
This attempt to help solve those problems is a spectacular one. It is the largest privately financed development project in history, almost half a billion dollars. Fifty-one lending institutions put up money to clear an old commercial strip downtown. In its place are four 40-story office buildings now partially occupied. Some of the firms moving here fled to the suburbs years ago. In the center, a 73-story hotel, the world's tallest, which opened today. Renaissance Center, the whole project is called, and it is hoped this will be the renaissance of the Detroit downtown area. In the face of the adversity that we've had and that other cities have had, in the face of the predictions by many doubters that would never be completed, is a massive statement for cities all across this nation that we do and do indeed have a future. We are indeed in the process of rebuilding. It's going to have uh, all kinds of ripple effects throughout the community. Uh, saving of America's cities is the greatest challenge I think we face in this country today. And if you talk about Detroit, what is happening here is going to be one of the most important moves that has ever been taken in this city. The exodus from Detroit began when Henry Ford decided to move his assembly line to suburban Dearborn. That was 1915. It's hoped that this spectacular project will attract both businesses and jobs back to the inner city. Don Webster, this CBS was News. was harder hit by riots during the racial turmoil of 1967 than Detroit. The causes of those disturbances excited instant attention, and as Bob Fall reports, a search directed from the White House for a conspiracy that was never found. Rioting in Detroit began July 23, 1967, and when it ended eight days later, 43 people had died, 6,000 had been arrested, and property losses were estimated at at least $80 million. Many politicians felt the riots were started by radical groups which conspired to incite violence. But 1,300 pages of FBI documents just released under the Freedom of Information Act show that despite tips from Gerald Ford, Spiro Agnew, and top Justice Department executives, police agencies were unable to find any evidence of conspiracy. What the documents do show is that former President Lyndon Johnson repeatedly pressured then-FBI Director J. Edgar Hoover to find information which could embarrass Michigan Governor George Romney, then a leading presidential hopeful. A White House aide quoted in this memo of August 3, 1967, asked Hoover to obtain Romney's radio tapes to show, quote, that Governor Romney had vacillated back and forth as to whether federal troops should be called into Detroit. The memo adding, quote, the White House did not desire for anyone outside to realize that they were attempting to obtain these tapes for the president. Asked about the memo, Romney said that because of politics, federal troops were deployed 12 hours late and then only after he was forced to concede in writing that the situation was out of control. The documents also show that President Johnson was so certain there was a conspiracy, Hoover said Johnson told him, quote, to keep my men busy to find a central character to it, to watch and see and we will find some central theme. But the FBI did not. Bob Fall, CBS News, Detroit. The divided Republican National Committee today chose Detroit as the site of the party's 1980 National Convention. A floor fight preceding the vote reflected the continuing struggle between Republican moderates and conservatives. Some moderates charged privately that conservative opponents did not want to meet in Gerald Ford's home state or in a labor stronghold with a large black population. In Detroit, the Democratic mayor welcomed the Republican action, as Betty Ann Bowser reports. Detroit offered its downtown Cobo Hall, which seats 20,000, and enough hotel rooms to house all the delegates. The city also offered its new image, symbolized by the towers of the Renaissance Center. Since its opening, businesses have begun to come back downtown. The crime rate has dropped 30 percent in two years. Convention business and the city's ability to handle it has increased, bookings up 85 percent over five years ago. City officials were jubilant when they learned Detroit had been selected. Mayor Coleman Young jokingly posed with a picture of him riding an elephant. Young said the convention will generate at least $7 million in new business for the city. I think the significance of being host uh, to this Republican convention is official recognition across the nation. That the city that was supposedly dead is now among the prime convention cities in the nation. Young said he thinks Detroit was the Republicans' choice because it is in a Midwest swing state of enormous political importance. And now he says he'll try to get the Democrats to bring their convention here, too. 
Finally, Young was asked what he would say to those Southern conservative members of the Republican National Committee who didn't vote for Detroit. And his answer? We all come. <laughs> Betty Ann Bowser, CBS News, Detroit. The balloting is over and the results are known in state and local elections around the nation. The big prize is up for grabs, governorships, and mayoral posts. In our election roundup, Victoria Corderi reports many new terms were war won by old faces. It was an election night that favored incumbents around the country. New Jersey Governor Thomas Kane's second term victory was a landslide. His acceptance speech reiterated his party's hopes that the Republican wave created by President Reagan's re-election hasn't crested. Just as we, the Republican Party, are a majority tonight, we can be the majority in this state and in this nation. But Democrats point to the election of Governor Gerald Belisles in Virginia as proof the national tide may yet turn. Virginia's Democratic sweep includes the first black and first woman elected to statewide office there. New York's outspoken mayor, Ed Koch, coasted to a third-term victory, as did Detroit Mayor Coleman Young in his bid for a fourth term. But the winning came less easily for Houston's incumbent mayor, Kathy Whitmire. Whitmire's opponent made her gay community support and AIDS major campaign issues. A stunning upset marked Miami's City Hall race. Six-term incumbent Maurice Ferre was edged out of the runoff that will take place November 12th. Instead, banker Raul Masvidal and lawyer Xavier Suarez will vie for the title of Miami's first Cuban-born mayor. Victoria Corderi, CBS News, New York. Voters confronted a variety Imagine of two pictures of one place taken a few decades apart. The earlier picture shows long conveyor belts moving, gears and cogs engaged, workers stamping parts and welding and bolting morning, afternoon and night. The second picture shows rusted machines and abandoned buildings and idle men and women, some with angry faces. Two pictures of one place, Detroit past and Detroit present. Leaving a third picture of Detroit future still to be imagined. Scott Pelley reports our cover story this Sunday morning. Detroit was the boomtown of the industrial age, auto capital of the world, economic giant, and a city that could guarantee a job. Today, signs of that past glory are still evident, but no city has suffered more in the changing world economy. Uh, the thing is pretty common here in Detroit that when the automobile industry uh, catches cold, Detroit catches pneumonia. Today, Detroit's children are learning a hard lesson. The auto industry of the 1930s is a museum piece. Fifty years ago, a strong back earned a paycheck in the factories painted by Diego Rivera. It started as a rebellion, ended as a holocaust, and to this day is known as the Great Detroit Riot. Detroit lost much of its identity after the riots and during the decline of the auto industry. One million people moved away, leaving gaps in more than just the landscape. It loses its soul. I mean, uh, Detroit has always had a special uh, place in American life. And uh, when you lose all those people, uh, you, you don't have the, the, the human dynamics necessary to sustain the city. Wilbur Rich is a political scientist at Wayne State University. Uh, and the economy is undergoing a transformation from a, a sort of a heavy metal economy to a kind of a, a service economy. And that's, that means that you're going to have jobs that are not paying $13 an hour. You're going to have jobs paying minimum wage and that kind of thing. Nine percent of the workforce is unemployed. Forty percent of the residents live in poverty. Murder is a leading cause of death among youth. Uh, the prevalence of guns, the random shooting, 
That's a frustration. Mayor Coleman Young. When I was first elected mayor, one of the major weekly news uh, magazines uh, carried a cover story. It was a question. There were a number of black mayors elected in 1973, and the question was, the black mayors, are they the saviors or the undertakers of the city? There were many who thought the, the latter, that we were the undertakers. In 16 years as mayor, Young has neither buried Detroit nor brought complete salvation. I have not been able to bring in enough jobs. I've not been able to reverse the exodus from our city, to stop the desertion of the city by many middle class people and by businesses. We're beginning to see that reversal now, but I have not succeeded in uh, turning it completely around. Some of the city's most innovative citizens have joined to develop a blueprint for the future, the Detroit Strategic Plan. It addresses the most stubborn problems, including employment and education. About 40% of Detroit students drop out. Here we are now. I think determined we're going to turn it around. And the resources are going to come from the city, mainly out of its own people. Father William Cunningham was a member of the Plans Employment Task Force. That white America generally, and American institutions, government, businesses, churches, really don't think that black people are capable of being fully human beings and first class citizens. His views were formed in the fires of Detroit's 1967 race riots. A disturbance on a level of uh, magnitude that was uh, overwhelming and so compelling that I left my job in the seminary and said I've got to, to respond to this. Father Cunningham's response is Focus Hope, three blocks of classrooms and industrial plants. How are you doing? Good. It's not just to provide jobs for people, it's to provide a skilled workforce that will attract businesses to want to be a part of this workforce. In the factories, he offers training and a practical education. Look for an old man in a shop. Look for an old man in a shop. Buy him a cup of coffee. He won't want to talk to you, especially if you're black. He's white. He ain't gonna want to spend any time with you. Buy him a cup of coffee. Bribe him a little bit. Be nice to him. Sweep his chips for him. Find out everything that old man knows. When you find out everything that old man in the shop knows, you got all that, it's time for you to move on. Because the books haven't been written that contain the knowledge you need to know about the machining industry. It's all on the old men. what to do? Good. Education is Father Cunningham's chief concern. Detroit high school graduates attend his remedial math and English classes before entering the job training program. But we can't train them unless they have those basic educational skills and the schools are not providing them. And in fact, there's a, a, a huge gulf, a Grand Canyon between where these kids graduate and where they have to be to be appropriately trained. Okay, this is another box. You almost see that there are an infinite number of boxes. There are a set number, there are a certain number, and I want you to try to determine how many boxes are within this one large box. This fall, under the strategic plan, business will enter the classroom with a contract. In some schools, students will be guaranteed jobs or college at graduation if they meet high academic standards. It says to our kids in school, we care. We businessmen, we teachers, we parents, we, uh, we labor people, we governmental people, we care about what happens to you. George Hill has enlisted his adhesives manufacturing company in the job guarantee program. You know, the bottom line on it is that as a businessman looking for persons to staff my organization, number one, I need them. As a citizen, number two, I believe that the more educated your citizenry is, 
uh, obviously the better off your community is. Hill grew up in Detroit, and now he wants today's students to have the same shot at the American dream. These are people who care enough, okay, to assure you that you're going to have a better life perhaps than I've had. So I'm expecting it to be a motivating factor, and I'd like to think in its, in its, in its broadest sense that it's also a magnet and a piece of adhesive that will bind the community together in a better way. For a moment last month, Detroit's many struggles were reduced to a single contest. The Pistons swept the NBA championship. For a long troubled city, it was a reminder that winning is possible. Pistons! Detroit is ineluctably bound to win the city. Here it's muscular, it's capable, it's built for struggle, genetically for generations. It comes from a people who have come here in order to win. So it's going to win. This period, and the period of the 80s, marked the reversal of the trend to downward and the beginning of the long pull upward. And I believe that the 90s will be a continuation of that long pull up. And I believe that by the year 2000, we will see a fully restored new and greater city of Detroit. coverage of the rage in Los Angeles. The scenes today bring back violent images from the 1960s. This time, the pictures are live and in color, but the storyline is much the same. First one drops her hand, dead man. Watts, the summer of 65. Newark, the summer of 67. Detroit, the summer of 67. It was a time when the phrase, long hot summer, meant days and nights of rioting, meant rage and violence, meant scores of dead and thousands of wounded. Long hot summer meant race war in the streets of our ghettos. It meant burn, baby, burn. Racial riots were not only a relic of the 60s. There were outbursts in the 80s as well. This is near Miami. Injustice! In almost every situation, the spark that ignited the violence was conflict between mostly white police and black men. But that was the surface cause. The roots of the problem were poverty and exploitation and unemployment and lack of opportunity and racism. Get your hands up. Let's go. What's changed? Racism, I think, is, is, is just socially endemic. It is not going anywhere. It has been here. It is, a, it is a, a historical phenomena that has been here ever since we've had in America. Consider this. Today there are more young African Americans caught up in the criminal justice system than there are in college. Homicide is the leading cause of death among black youth. The life expectancy for black men in Harlem is shorter than it is for men in Bangladesh. Does anyone care? We've seen a lack of commitment to young people, young people of color in these communities. And that's why they feel expendable. And that's why they feel that they are disposable. From Los Angeles 1965 to Los Angeles 1992, the common denominators are frustration and rage. Ten. And Joe's opponent was counted out. Every male, female, grown-up youngster or whatever would hit the front door and be out in the street jumping around. Only for maybe 30 seconds because then reality came in and we had to go to work so everybody ran back in the house again, you see. But, I mean, that was an experience and truly a great one that 
Lewis present Mrs. Lewis with this real token of appreciation from the highest body in our land. We recognize that Mr. Lewis is a legend, a legend for all of us who serve in government. So on behalf of my colleagues, Representative James Bradley, Representative George Edwards, and the Speaker of the House, Bill Ryan, Mrs. Lewis, we present this token of appreciation, the highest that we can give from the legislative body, and we say that the way we can enable the spirit of Mr. Lewis to live on is to make sure that... Mrs. Lewis and ladies and gentlemen, I came here tonight along with all of you to honor a great and a wonderful man. All of the years when I was a young man, Joe Lewis to me was a personal hero. And to Americans everywhere, Joe Lewis represents all that is fine and decent and great in this country. Joe Lewis, all of these years, has been in this country a tremendous force for human dignity, a tremendous force for interracial goodwill. In all of these years, Joe Lewis has been loved and respected. He has been a symbol of excellence, a symbol of quality, of humility, and of warmth. And that is why, as governor of this state, I am honored on behalf of all of the people of Michigan to have proclaimed this day, August 12th, Joe Lewis Day in Michigan in honor of a wonderful and a great man who will always be remembered for just that. Master of Ceremonies Bill Cosby, to city, county, and state dignitaries, I tip the proclamations with mixed emotions. First, it is a very happy occasion for Detroit, along with many other cities who are represented here tonight, to honor Joe Lewis, whom I think is one of the greatest Americans who've ever lived. It is fitting to do things while people are aware of them and they're still living. To, he loves Detroit for the spirit of this occasion, and I love you for it too. It's, it's sad because Joe cannot be here in person, but he's with you in spirit. And I want to thank each and every one of you for it. Mrs. Rosa Owens, who was the original uh, person who got the idea together for the salute to Joe Lewis, and Josephine Winifrey, along with many others, Night Train Lane, Dr. Bennett, and if I'm calling any names, please forgive me, because each person did their share to make this a tremendous success. But there came a man who you recognize in the program tonight that fought on Joe's card long years ago, and he fought on this card, and he fought well. And that is in the person of Barry Gordy, Jr. <laughs> Mr. Gordy has done the most unusual thing, need I tell you, and that is to succeed in the record business. He was the founder and he is the president of Motown Records. And he has some of the hottest acts that are in show business today. And again, Joe personally wants to thank Mr. Barry Gordy for being the honorary chairman for this. He's a very busy man and he's very successful. But with this, 
along with the person he fought on the card, but he has humility, he has a soul, and he's a great person. And again, Joe, just to thank all of you, and I join in thanking him with you. Thank you. Mrs. Lewis. Now, the way you can say thank you to Joe is to do it for his wife here. Let's give her a big hand, please, ladies and gentlemen. Get up off your feet! Get up! Joe Lewis! Thank you. And now, H.B. Uh, Barnum has something from the fruitful state of California for you. I'm not going to dip my... I'm going to stand up straight. I'm standing up straight. Oh, yes, it will now. And caress yes, your way. Oh, yes, it will. And your heart. to fly away. Let's everybody get together and sing it now. Did it. Did it. Oh, yeah. And he'll kiss yes, he will. your lips. Oh, yes, he will now. And caress yes, your will. waiting fingertips. Oh, yes, he will. And your heart will fly. To fly away like a bird on the wing. Let's oh. everybody put a little love in our hearts. Put a little love in your heart. In the world, and the world will be a better place. The world, and the world will be a better place for you. The day goes by and still the children cry, yeah. Put a little love in your heart, yeah. We want the world alone. We won't let hatred grow, no. Put a little love in your heart, yeah. The world and the world will be a better place. This beautiful world will be a better place. And Miss Mahalia Jackson. Shut the hell up, my damn boy, stop the hell up, none 
I can be sold. Come on, children, let's sing. That's a good one. Stop the damn music, man. We got two minutes left. I have two minutes. They gave me 15 minutes, and ain't much I can do in 15 minutes. My old lady's in California. <laughs> uh, but I'll tell you the truth. A nigga tried to stick me up in Baltimore two weeks ago. Nigga gonna stick up a black man. Wasn't that dumb? <laughs> Nigga gonna rob Zorro. <laughs> this nigga jumped out the alley, didn't have a gun, a pipe, or a brick. All he knew was karate. Jumped out the alley and said, stick up. <laughs> I got a black belt. I said, well, they gonna need it to lower your ass in the ground. A couple of good stories. It is, no, good. Yeah, I'm, I'm working in Las Vegas, and, and if you come out there next week, I'll be there for two more months. <laughs> How you fellas? A lot of people wearing glasses tonight. You notice that? A lot of folks wear glasses, never take time out to think how far ahead nature was planning as to put ears in the right place in case you had to wear glasses. See, if this meat wasn't here, my glasses would be on the floor. See, because you can cut this meat off completely and still here because the hole is more important than the meat. Things ever put it on the face of this earth. We can, we can see Bill Cosby on television any week. We can hear the Jackson 5 on the radio and see them anytime they are appearing. Tonight we are honoring one of ours for probably the first time in the history of his life. We are honoring him. Let us not forget why we're here tonight, please. Because it's only going to last until you get out of the door. Now let us run the film clip, please. <laughs> 